Kia ora everyone and welcome to this Good Fellow webinar on Jula Gulu Tide One Year On. This episode is kindly supported by an educational grant from Lily. The content is entirely independent and was developed by the Good Fellow Unit and our expert speaker. I'm Dr. Louise Kugler from the Good Fellow Unit and tonight I'm talking to Dr. Ryan Paul about Jula Gulu Tide One Year On. Ryan is an endocrinologist and diabetologist at Waikato District Health Board. He is a senior lecturer at the University of Waikato, and he has many research interests, including the emergent technologies in type 1 diabetes, the management of diabetes in youth and young adults, reducing inequities in diabetes care, and Maori and rural populations. He is the current president of New Zealand Society of Endocrinology. I'd like to hand over to Ryan. Kia ora, Ryan, and welcome. Kia ora, Louise, and um, kia ora koutou. Um, yeah, kia ora, Ryan Paul. I'm Taka Inga. So um, thank you for the kind introduction. Please do put any questions you've got um, in the Q&A section. It may be directly on dental glutide. It may be other things in, in, in diabetes. Uh, but we have, um, it's been, been a year, um, essentially, since we had dental glutide available, um, which has been a great addition to the armory. So in terms of relevant disclosures, I am receiving an honoraire, and I'm also a member of the advisory board um, for Doodle Glutide, but all content is my own, and I will stress all the recommendations I talk about, which will include some off-label use and clinical tips, uh, are my own content. So if we take a step back and have a look at the big picture, we now know that it's well over 280,000 um, people in Aotearoa, New Zealand, with diabetes, and most of those will die from cardiovascular disease. Um, and with those, um, with those stats, that data, you really see some of the greatest disparities for Māori and Pacific people come through. In fact, Māori are uh, at least one and a half times more likely to die from cardiovascular disease, and at least three to four times to develop renal disease, and those figures are just uh, even worse for Pacific peoples. And what's really sad um, is that, that those stats have not changed in the past 20 years. So we did have the arrival of empagliflozin or Jardiance in February last year and dutaglutide or Trilicity in September. And it really is um, great tools in trying to improve our inequities. So in terms of a brief outline um, for tonight, I will do a wee bit of a refresher. Um, you know, just let you know, what is dutaglutide? How does it work? And then have a look at some of the data around, you know, what has actually the uptake been over the past 12 months and what's changed in the evidence around dutaglutide, um, as well as hopefully some clinical pearls which you may find useful. Um, I'm sure many of you have used dutaglutide a lot already. Some of you may not be familiar um, with so much of dutaglutide, so I try to cover all, all bases. So we start off you know, in terms of what is dutaglutide and, and how does it work? It may be a wee bit of a refresher um, from medical school many years ago, but dutaglutide is a glucagon-like peptide 1, or GLP-1 um, receptor agonist. Um, it's been available um, since 2014 um, worldwide, so it's not new. Um, and many of its family members have actually been around a lot longer, since 2005. And Xenotide or Bieta was the first um, GLP-1 receptor agonist that became available. So it is an incretin. So incretins are your endogenous gut hormones that are produced in response to nutrients. Um, and what they do is they have a particular action on beta cells in the pancreas, um, which are cells that produce insulin. So they incre increase glucose-dependent insulin secretion. So what that means is if your glucose levels are high, you get much greater insulin secretion. If your glucose levels are you know, normal or low, you do not get any increase in insulin secretion. So that's why dutaglutide will not cause hypoglycemia alone, is that insulin secretion is insulin dependent. If you want to have a, a, um, a, I guess, a take-home message, only insulin and sulfonylureas will cause significant hypoglycemia, but other agents will not. Um, so, but as well as getting the increased insulin secretion, glucagon also reduces glucagon secretion. Um, which reduces hepatic glucose output, and it probably preserves beta cell mass as well. So all of a sudden, you can see that benefit directly on, on the pancreas um, itself. And here's just, um, uh, I guess, a, a pictorial you know, demonstrating that incretin effect or that greater insulin secretion. So on the left here, we have an unhealthy patients. And here's the response and insulin secretion in red. If I give you an IV glucose infusion, in black if you eat, um, or basically if you have oral glucose intake. So it's your incretins and particularly your GLP-1 
which is responsible just for that much greater insulin secretion response to food rather than IV glucose. And you can see on the right here, um, in patients with diabetes, they have a much um, diminished um, and creatine effect. It's one of the, one of the, I guess, the eight or the one of the ominous octet for why patients get diabetes. One of those is around reduced GLP-1. This is why deutoglutide is, is so exciting. But it's not just the pancreas um, that deutoglutide acts on. Um, in fact, one of its major act um, actions is slowing down um, gastric emptying or, or transit through the gut and acting directly on hypothalamic appetite centers. Um, that is why deutoglutide is a, a potent agent for weight loss. In fact, many of you will be familiar with liraglutide or succenda, um, which is a family member used for obesity. Um, but your GLP-1 agonists also directly act on, on heart and endothelium, which is another reason why you get reduced cardiovascular disease. That's up and above the effects on glycemic control and also likely has renoprotective um, and, and bone, um, bone protection as well. So it acts in many um, parts of the body. And here's just a, a pictorial demonstrating that. We think of the, the widespread um, pleiotropic effects of, of, of deutoglutide. So um, it is known as Trulicity, um, as, its, as its drug name, but it's only available in one dose. It's at 1.5 milligram dose um, in our Tauron, New Zealand. Um, it's a subcutaneous injection once a week. Um, so overseas, they do have um, the 0.75, 3, and 4.5 milligram doses. Hopefully they will come some stage in the next year um, to our Tauron. But at the moment, we've only got one dose, which does make things easier um, from a dose titration point of view. So you can inform your patients it can be injected any time of day on any day of the week. Usually it's best just to pick a day that fits into their routine and they remember their injection. Um, it's very similar to any other subcut inje um, injection. Um, the, the needle's tiny, it's only 29 gauge and it's inbuilt so patients never actually see the needles. And I'll show you a pen what that looks like. And that can be injected in all the normal sites. And if a patient misses a dose, it's fine to take that dose you know, up, up to three days late. Um, if, it, if they miss the dose later than that, you can just say, wait, wait to the next injection. Um, so when the pens are dispensed, they are dispensed in packs of four, um, and those pens should be kept in the fridge. Um, but once the pen's out, it's actually fine to be used and um, kept at room temperature um, for about two weeks. But they are single-use pens, um, and so as soon as they've used it, you dispose of it um, as, as normal disposal um, for sharps in, in your region. Um, and the only thing... I guess you think about when you're adding on deutoglutide uh, in terms of the escalation of therapy, that vildagliptin becomes redundant. That's because vildagliptin is a DPP-4 inhibitor, which breaks down um, GLP-1 naturally in the body, um, but deutoglutide is resistant um, to that. So all of a sudden, vildagliptin becomes redundant, and that's why we say, you know, stop the vildagliptin when you start, start the trulicity. Um, if they're on galvumet, you then be switching to metformin alone. So it's just remembering that when you, when you add on add on therapy. Here's a picture just showing what, what the pens look like. Um, and they are, are very simple um, pens to use. You literally take, take the black cap off, um, get the pen um, perpendicular to, um, to the body, um, and then just switch um, the lock at the top um, from the red to green, and then push down the button. And I always get patients to count um, for, you know, for five to 10 seconds. Um, before they then um, withdraw the pen. Um, it's great if you can get a demo pen or the information um, pack from, from the Lily reps. If you don't have those in, in your practice, um, what you can do is you can just write pharmacy education, please, on the script, and that will and, um, basically give a heads up for the pharmacist to do that education for you. Um, so it's a, a useful tip um, as well. So you're thinking, you know, what, what changes do we see? What, what are the improvements? Well, the first thing I'll say is that the improvements in glycemic control are really dependent on what your baseline glycemic control is like. Um, so, you know, if the patient's already got fairly tight glycemic control, we'll say like an HbA1c of 56 millimole per mole, you may only see about a five to six millimole um, per mole reduction in HbA1c. Still enough to get them to target, but not dramatic, um, whereas you do see dramatic reductions often um, in those patients with an elevated HbA1c, particularly above 70, you know, you may see up to, you know, 25 millimole per mole reduction. I have seen reductions greater than that. A lot is dependent on the changes in lifestyle um, which go along the, the time you introduce deutoglutide. And it's always a perfect time to you know, re-emphasize that, particularly when you're looking for weight loss. Um, 
And uh, I will say it's really interesting in the studies as well that have looked at, you know, in those patients on, on metformin where they've added in um, deglutide or basal insulin. And what they've found is actually the reductions with deglutide are more um, than for basal insulin. There's no clear explanation for that, um, but likely explains, you know, the reduced um, appetite and reduced oral intake um, and weight loss that you, and increased weight loss that you do get um, with deglutide and probably just around about that fear of, you know, of hypoglycemia. Just to emphasize, deglutide will not cause hypoglycemia alone. Um, and what's really exciting is that if you've got a patient that has an HbA1c2 target or closer target and they're on insulin already, um, you may actually be able to get them off their insulin if they're on sort of less than 40 units of insulin a day. So all of a sudden, you'll have a whole lot of patients in your practice where hopefully you can work backwards and introduce the deoglutide and get them off their, off their sulfonylureas and insulin. So we spoke about weight loss. Um, the mean reduction is only two kilograms of, of weight, um, but that is better than the weight gain that you typically see in placebo. But once again, I've seen patients lose at least 20 to 30 kilograms on deoglutide. It's a lot, um, you know, depending on, you know, push, push that lifestyle change. You do also get mild reductions in blood pressure and LDL cholesterol, which likely explains some of the extra glycemic um, reductions in glycemic control. So in terms of numbers needed to treat, um, they are, and this is for five years, for secondary prevention, you're looking at um, an NNT of 18. Um, but important, that's on top of all your other treatment. That's on top of aspirin, beta blockers, and statins. Okay, so... Um, and that, they still remain as important as ever, um, but NNT is relatively low compared to other treatments. What's also exciting for, for deoglutide is it has an NNT of about 60 over a five-year period for patients which are high risk um, but don't have established cardiovascular disease. So there is essentially evidence for primary prevention, which is not true for empagliflozin, and it's not true for other GLP-1 receptor agonists. It's unique for deoglutide. Um, and I will say it's cardiovascular disease only, it's not renal disease. And those benefits are, um, seem to be mainly for stroke. So particularly those that you know, do have high risk for cerebrovascular disease, this may be one agent that you turn to um, in particular. We know, I will say we know very well that empagliflozin reduces the progression of renal disease once it's present. Um, there is evidence for deoglutide to do the same. But unlike empagliflozin, it's yet to be shown, deoglutide's yet to be shown to prevent dialysis or, or renal death. So what that means is, if you had a patient that had predominantly renal disease, I would be choosing empagliflozin over deoglutide. Um, but if you had a patient that had cardiovascular disease, that may well push you more towards deoglutide over empagliflozin. Now, I'll come to that further, but it can be a really hard um, clinical decision um, to make. But I will stress that these benefits of both deoglutide and empagliflozin are up and above that of glycemic control. So you're treating your patients regardless of HbA1c, which moves away from that old, um, you know, our old stepwise ladder that we used to have, have you know, five, five years ago or greater, that was purely HbA1c based. Now we're moving to complication based, um, which is really important when, when you think about, think about your patients. So no drugs without adverse effects. Um, and I will say by far the most common adverse effect is nausea. Um, it may happen in about a quarter, a third, or up to a quarter, a third of your patients. But the really important thing is that you warn patients it's going to happen and reassure them that it's transient. Because in almost all cases, it, it will um, resolve completely. They can continue treatment without trouble. Um, I will say, though, that in terms of the, the the initial studies was only about one to two percent that had to stop because of significant nausea or vomiting. I've found that's probably slightly higher um, in, in, in the real world, but it's still less than five percent. Um, but in those patients who are um, you know who are at risk of vomiting, I will be making sure that they stay well hydrated um, because there have been very rare case reports of renal injury and do get them to contact your practice if they do have significant vomiting um, as antiemetics can be very effective. Um, so it's just making sure that for those patients that, that you keep contact. Um, also very, very rarely as well as the nausea, um, they can get constipation um, or diarrhea. But once again, that's also um, usually transient. Um, the other, um, I guess, transient reaction that can occur 
um, is it just mild injection site reactions. Typically, it's just a little bit of redness. Um, nodules are rare, and that once again usually dissipates um, over the next few weeks despite continuing treatment. Very rarely do you need to use antihistamines or you know local steroid creams. You've always got that um, in potential. But I haven't had to use any of those yet. Um, around, I guess, the other significant adverse effects, you will see pancreatitis and medullary thyroid carcinoma if you read the MedSafe handout. Um, but both of those are controversial. And the reason why is even though pancreatitis has occurred in all the drug trials with dilutide and the other GLP-1 receptor agonists, have always been at the same rate um, as um, placebo. So the only time I, I will not use um, glutide with that background of pancreatitis is basically having recurrent episodes of, of unclear cause. If they've got previous pancreatitis, you know, it, it may be gallstone induced or alcohol um, or, or clear reason, I will use dutaglutide. Um, but obviously if pancreatitis occurs on dutaglutide, that'd be one reason why you'd, why you'd likely stop it. I will say though, don't routinely measure um, lipase or amylase, you will find they go up. Okay, so don't base any decision making on that based on symptoms of pancreatitis um, alone. Similarly, for medullary thyroid carcinoma, that's only occurred in animal studies. It has not occurred in, in, in humans to date. So just so you know, medullary thyroid carcinoma is really rare. Um, by far, your most common cause of thyroid cancer, papillary, uh, papillary and follicular cancer. I've only seen, like myself, less than five to 10 cases of medullary thyroid carcinoma. I can assure you that you've probably never seen it. And it's only medullary thyroid carcinoma that you would not use um, dutaglutide. As I explained, um, hypoglycemia will only potentially occur if they're on insulin um, or sulfonylureas. So in terms of, I guess, precautions of use, there's no safety data during pregnancy and breastfeeding. Um, so we're not using it in that group. Um, similarly, there's no safety data in children less than 10 years of age or in those with significant renal impairment with an EGFR less than 15 mil per minute. Um, so please, you know, I would not be using it in that group. Um, and also not be using it in type 1 diabetes um, without specialist approval. It's also not funded for type 1 diabetes, just so you're aware of that. But choosing sort of patient selection um, is really important for both dutaglutide and empagliflozin. If we just think about dutaglutide, I would not be using it in those with significant gastrointestinal disease just because of the potential for making that worse. And the, the real, I guess, um, examples there, uh, gastroparesis, um, which can be common with end-stage diabetes, um, that would make that far worse. Or they've got severe gastroesophageal reflux will also likely make, make that you know, uh, more, more severe. So that, that would stop me from using dutaglutide. Or anything where you'd be worried about um, you know, if patients did get severe vomiting and diarrhea, if that would really hit them for six. And I guess that's really around the frail and elderly um, in, in particular. Um, and I've discussed the other other um, potential precautions there, um, but they're much less than, than, those, than those above. So what has the uptake been um, in our Aotearoa over the past year? And the data is, is really interesting. So we have great... Um, primary care data um, in the Waikato, including real-time diabetes dashboards. I really like to, to thank our, our data leads and diabetes leads in each, uh, each of our PHOs, Pinnacle, NHC and Hauraki, and, and really leading that. This is data that's taken um, from um, a year, oh, sorry, from a month ago now, sorry. And, and these are looking at, at those who should be on either empagliflozin or dutaglutide. So that's all those with cardiovascular disease, renal disease or, or the equivalent high cardiovascular risk, so at 15% and above. And what I can tell you, and this is this two PHO data here, um, is that we've roughly got about 50 to 60% of the patients who need to be on these agents, on these agents um, over the past year. Um, and I suspect that's a lot um, higher than, than the national average, but you'll find you know, the, the rate varies um, with, between regions to regions greatly. Because empagliflozin got rolled out earlier, um, we do have only about sort of 10% on, on dutaglutide. But what we're finding with times that goes along is these numbers are becoming, becoming a, lot, a lot more even um, in terms of choosing between the two. But as well as variability between region to region, there's also a lot of variability um, between, between practices. So here is um, actually demonstrating every gray bar um, is... 
um, a, a practice um, within the Waikato region. And the thickness of the bar indicates the number of patients. Um, and these are actually Māori patients with um, either renal disease, cardiovascular disease, or that high cardiovascular risk. So, so Māori that which should be on, you know, either empica flows and, and or dudoglutide. And what we can find is absolutely fantastic that we have several practices that have 100 percent So they've done really well in identifying those patients and getting them onto therapy. I guess what's a worry is it's probably at least three to four times more um, who haven't started either empica flows and or dudoglutide at all. And that's where the education is really important. Um, and you know, hopefully, if you're if you're a member of one of those practices, you can help um, you know upskill others in your practice. Um, other things that you know I will say is I've had lots of people say, "I'm not going to use these agents because they're new. I'm going to be I'm going to take a wait and see approach." Just remember that these agents, you know, dilutate impica phones have been used worldwide for many years. We know that they work. We do not need to wait um, wait to use them. So it's a, a, a little plug there. Um, you know, for trying to, to, you know, hopefully now coming out the end of COVID, we can now turn the tide on, on diabetes. Um, what's really interesting as well, you know, we've had Empica flows and, and, and dudoglutide um, now for a year, but we, this is um, in one PHO, we haven't actually increased the number of people to target at all. So I really want to, you know, this talks on dudoglutide. But I want you to think about all your glucose lowering therapies and trying to increase that number. So we know that HbA1c target for most is less than 53 millimole per mole, um, but we only have, and this is true across the board, um, you know, only about 40% at best of our patients with type 2 diabetes to target. And this is something we can do, um, you know, hopefully do a lot better on. As well as, um, I guess, not, in, not changing the, the number of people to, to target, we haven't also increased the um, use of ACE inhibitors, um, statins, or metformin as, as we should be. So when the, you, you're looking, and I will say this, if you're looking at using, you know, dudoglutide empica flows in, in your patients, it's also the perfect time to be thinking, you know, should they be on metformin? And that's basically everyone with diabetes, uh, with type 2 diabetes with an EGFR above 15. You know, should they be an ACE inhibitor or ARB? And that's essentially all those with any evidence of renal disease, so micro macroalbuminuria or reduce the GFR, or should they be in a statin? And once again, that's everyone with renal disease or cardiovascular disease with an LDL above 1.8, um, because they have not, the use of those agents has not changed at all over the past year. And this is the perfect opportunity to be, you know, escalating all of care. So I think what is exciting about the ethnicity clause and the special authority criteria, so we'll stress at this point, is that Māori and Pacific ethnicity um, was added to that special authority criteria, um, not because it either empica flows or dudoglutide work any better in that group, but to increase access. Um, and so it's a key, uh, you know, a key point. What I've got here is shown basically the um, prescribing rates for um, between Māori and blue, Pacific and orange, and European and grey for the clinical indications for met metformin, ACE inhibitors, and ARBs, and statins. Um, and basically, there's no, no inequities um, in basically for those medications. I can say this is in the Waikato. I'm, I'm proud to say that. Um, our practices have done fantastically well in reducing and basically abolishing those inequities. I know that's not true across all the country. Um, but what's also um, very, um, I guess, highlighted by the special authority criteria is those that are clinically indicated for empica flows and dudoglutides, you know, that renal disease, cardiovascular disease, or high cardiovascular risk, it's much greater and this is significant for Māori and Pacific than European. So it is showing that it is helping to, you know, um, hopefully reduce those, um, you know, reduce those inequities and, and turn the tide. So you please keep so putting those questions in the in the Q and A, um, and we can answer. Um, I'll answer all, all the questions at, at the end. So what has changed um, with dudoglutide in, in the past twelve months? Well, I can only say that the um, every literally every every week, if not every day, there's more and more literature coming out supporting that um, dudoglutide and other SLG inhibitors and GLP. Um, one receptor agonists um, uh, prevent, you know, second um, episodes of cardiovascular disease. So there's still no head-to-head -head studies showing, you know, whether empica flows and dudoglutide is better um, for a certain patient. Um, that's why we, you know, we can't say, you know, which, you know, why we can't give a definitive answer, you know, which one's best. 
um, and we're still waiting the evidence that dilutamide reduces dialysis and renal death, although that data shouldn't be too far away. Um, there's also no conclusive evidence. So we've got that that one. Um, it's only the rewind trial that one study that showed that do good type prevents cardiovascular and renal disease uh, prevents cardiovascular disease we're still waiting for any evidence that empagliflozin or dudaglutide um, you know prevents cardiovascular um, or, or renal disease um, but if there is any evidence it's for dudaglutide so it would push you towards towards that so however the real world data is probably showing that they they are both effective but we're waiting for the conclusive data that to come out and what's also um, exciting is that we now have data. Um, we've got our first um, phase three trial out showing that dudaglutide is safe and effective in 10 to 17 year olds. Um, it's still not, I will point out, it's still not registered um, for this age group in, in our terra. What that means is, and, and for that group, and it literally was um, for, for youth with diabetes, metformin, then insulin, and we've now got dudaglutide. Um, so it'd be metformin and then dudaglutide and then the potential for insulin um, if, if needs be. But there's still no data for dudaglutide in, in pregnancy um, or breastfeeding. Um, so I'll be avoiding those groups. There's still no um, evidence for safety of empica flows in those between 10 to 17 year olds. So that age group would push you more towards um, more towards dudaglutide. So I regularly meet um, with Pharmac and I can tell you that there's unfortunately likely no change in the special authority criteria in the near future. So we're still confined to using either funded dudaglutide or, or empagliflozin. Um, and we're not going to be, you know, that um, HP on C barrier and, and use of other glucose lowering agents not going to be removed either. Um, but I will say, though, that, you know, all of your patients should ideally be on metformin anyway, so that, you know, that other medication, um, you should not um, um, be, a, be a barrier. Um, because uh, I'll talk about self funding um, in a moment, um, but just remember it's a lot cheaper for your patients that are going to use both agents, both dilutamide and empagliflozin, to get the dilutamide funded uh, and then get them to self-fund the empagliflozin. And I can discuss a, a potential tricks around that as well. So we're still confined um, to just using the 1.5 milligram dose of dilutamide at the moment, um, as we don't have the 3 and 4.5 milligram doses that are available overseas. Um, but I know that um, many of you, um, and I'll include myself in this, have started to use two injections of dudaglutide a week. Um, and the indication for that would be if the HP1C was above target on the 1.5 milligram dose and they're tolerating it well. Now, when you add in a second injection, you're doing that only for glycemic control. It does not give you any additional cardiovascular benefit. So it's important to know that. You may get greater benefit on, on but you may get greater benefit on weight loss. Um, as well. And when I add in a second injection, I split the dose across the week. And for anecdotally, what I've found is that many patients on, on the weekly dose of dudaglutide do get a wee bit of wearing off effect. And if you split that dose across the week, um, you can find that you get um, you know, much more profound effects. So for example, if you've got a patient that takes the trilisy injection every Sunday, you can, they can take their second injection on a Wednesday. Um, so they will be, um, they are funded um, the patients won't have to pay anymore. They are funded on the special authority criteria for this. If they're self-funding, they will have to pay double um, and pharmacies still get dispensed um, in case you're wondering about that. Um, there were some initial, um, I guess, supply issues with dudaglutide, um, but these have all resolved. Um, and I have found for those that were self-funding um, dudaglutide, there was a lot of variation in prices between pharmacies, you know, even up to you know, $50 a month. Um, that seems to reduce right down, and you're probably looking around about that, um, you know, two hundred to two hundred and forty dollars a month now for, for self-funded dudaglutide for one for one injection per week. So when should I use it? You know, we've had, I guess, you know, we know the previous evidence. We've had a change in evidence. What are the clinical indications for for using dudaglutide? And I will encourage you to go back and have a look at the our management algorithm. So that is on. And, you know, and New Zealand Society of Diabetes, it should also be on all your health pathways um, platforms. Um, so with that, so you'll notice it expires, um, it already expired recently, we are gonna update that, so you see so aware of that. Um, but to go into to more detail, lifestyle management metformin always remains first line management of type two diabetes, and that's true at every stage. 
Um, but when you're thinking about escalation of the therapy, you're thinking about that early. If the HbA1c is above 64 millimole per mole, it's unlikely to get there for metformin alone. And if they've got cardiovascular um, disease or renal disease or heart failure, this is where Empica flows in and diglutide come in. Otherwise, um, you, you know, you're thinking about actually vitagliptin might be um, an appropriate agent to use. But when you, if you remember, if you need to add in diglutide at a later date, you need to stop that, stop that um, vitagliptin. Um, and essentially, um, when you go think about that, that renal disease um, or cardiovascular disease, um, I will say if they've got predominant renal disease or heart failure, that's going to push you more towards empagliflozin. Otherwise, you're looking at diglutide or empagliflozin, and you might be swayed more towards diglutide if you're looking for greater lowering of um, um, HPLNC or greater weight loss. Diglutide is probably more effective there and also in preventing um, cerebrovascular disease because empagliflozin and other SGL2 inhibitors are yet to be shown to um, prevent strokes. So in terms of summarizing that in best practice, as I said, um, you know, lifestyle changes are and metformin always first line. And remember that when you're starting to do the glutide, it's the best time to reinforce that again, because patients will say love seeing results. It can, you know, create um, a great cycle of benefit. And then you're looking at, you know, you're treating if, the, um, if they've got diabetes and they've got cardiovascular disease or renal disease, Ideally, um, best practice is to use empagliflozin flows and all deuteroglutide regardless of the HbA1c. You're treating their complications, not their, um, not their purely their glycemic control. I know the HbA1c is, is, has to be above 53 millimole per mole per funding. If it's lower than that, it's still best practice to use, um, you know, use the agents. That's that mismatch that you get with the special authority criteria. Um, now we've got the safety data in 10 to 17 year olds. I will say that I'll be using deuteroglutide second line after metformin in this group if the HbA1c is above target. Um, but I will just emphasize that it's technically off-label um, because our um, MedSafe data is yet to change in, in our Aotearoa for that. The other time where deuteroglutide is, is really useful is if the HbA1c is above target and the patient's overweight, um, either metformin um, and or vertigliptin alone. That's another the time I'll be using deuteroglutide. So previously, when you may have gone, you know, metformin, sulfonylureas, and insulin, sulfonylureas and insulin are now well down, well down the ladder. Um, I've spoken about, I guess, that mismatch with the special authority criteria, and that deuteroglutide would be a better option than empagliflozin for many patients. It'll be vice versa, um, vice versa for others. So here's the special authority criteria. Um, just to reinforce it, I'm sure you're very familiar with it. For those that aren't, just remember it's only type 2 diabetes. Um, they are supposed to have an HbA1c of over 53 millimole per mole um, after treatment for at least three months of at least one glucose lowering therapy. That can, so that can be any glucose lowering therapy. It could be metformin, filagliptin, it could be insulin. Um, and they have to have at least one of the other. And that's any events of renal disease, that's any microalbuminuria or low EGFR, any cardiovascular disease. And remember that includes, you know, things like peripheral vascular disease, includes familial hypercholesteremia, um, you know, previous TIA. It doesn't necessarily have to be ischemic heart disease. If they've got equivalent, you know, high cardiovascular risk, um, or if they've got diabetes, onset of di diabetes at a young age, um, there's no clear-cut criteria what young is. I think it changes the older you get. I will say I do count anything under 40 um, as onset of diabetes at a young age. And obviously if they have um, Maori or Pacific ethnicity. So I need one of these um, combined with the above and they'll get funded due to glutide or empagliflozin. Um, I guess the problem I've got in our te rā is only one will be funded. And I will stress this is purely financial based. Um, both agents can be used together. In fact, both agents are very effective together and um, you get that synergistic benefit and weight loss, um, glycemic control and reducing cardiovascular disease. So if you've got someone, um, you know, that's on metformin um, and empagliflozin, then deuteroglutide is typically always the next best cab off the rank. Um, same vice versa. If you've got someone on metformin and deuteroglutide, then empagliflozin is typically the next best cab of the rank or off the rank if the HbA1c is above target. Okay, and it's just remembering that in terms of getting the greatest benefit um, for your patient. Um, for those who haven't done the special authority criteria, it's very easy if they've already been, if you're switching from empagliflozin, I mean, you just tick this box and you're done. Otherwise, you just have to tick 
um, the relevant um, two boxes and, and which, which one they qualify under. So when should the patient self-fund? Um, it can be a difficult conversation. I think it's an important one to have with your patients. Um, I never think you could assume who can pay um, and who, who can't pay. Um, I've always been surprised by you know friends and, and whanau that have come up with, with funds. But I think it's at the same time, it's very important not to put financial pressure on, you know, on patients because obviously it's a lot of money um, and outside of, of, of most patients, um, you know, many patients' financial capabilities. So times when it's best practice to use empagliflozin on dutoglutide is when basically they've got cardiovascular disease or renal disease and they don't meet the special authority criteria. The most common scenario for that is if the HP on C is less than 53 millimole per mole. It seems criminal to let their control deteriorate um, to meet funding, um, but that's the way the special authority criteria stands um, at present. Uh, sort of spoken about if they do have cardiovascular disease, about that, you know, the add on, you know, to empica flows and authority on dutoglutide and vice versa. I will say there's yet to be any evidence they have a synergistic benefit in reducing renal disease. So it's only really around cardiovascular disease at, at that point. Um, the other times when, when you, you may think about patient self-funding is when they're um, not Māori or Pacific or onset at a young age and they've got HB1C above target on metformin. It'd be great to use Empica flows on dutoglutide in that group. Um, weight loss is you know, beneficial. And unfortunately, vertigotin's weight neutral, pi got his own, you get mild and soften resonance and you, you get weight gain. So really, um, empica flows and dutoglutide are the only ones which lead to weight loss. Um, and, and similarly, you know, for, for those non mild non-Pacific, if the HB1C is above target, I'm metformin and Um So it's, just, it's, it's where the HB1C does come into your decision making. So in terms of the choice between dutoglutide and empagliflozin, I think this can be a really clinical, um, clinically difficult decision just because there are no head-to-head -head studies. Um, you probably can say um, with hand on heart that dutoglutide likely leads to a greater decrease in HB1C and weight um, and does have some potential in primary prevention where there's no evidence for empagliflozin as yet. So that may well govern your decision. Um, and I will say actually patient preference will probably be the biggest factor here. One thing I've also had to find is, you know, dutoglutide is only injection. Um, and a lot of patients think all injections, and very understandably so, that all injections for diabetes are insulin. And there's that fear of insulin um, because, you know, the risk of hypoglycemia and they've seen, you know, whanau die from, um, you know, die from insulin or shortly after starting insulin. So they're keen to avoid injections um, if all possible. There's obviously the pain of injections as well. Um, I've always found though, you know, you, and I've done it to myself, I'm sure many of you have tried it um, as well, that the subcut um, injections probably hurt about 10 times less than finger pricks to check glucose levels. And putting it in that perspective and the fact that it's a once weekly injection, many patients get over any fear of needles they have um, very rapidly. You could always try um, you know, other strategies as on top of that if you want to, to, to reduce the pain, um, such as, you know, tapping on the skin or ice to the skin. Um, but once again, you know, you typically don't need that because the pain so minimal from um, dutoglutide injections anyhow. The other things which may, you know, alter your decision-making between dutoglutide and empagliflozin, remember, I've tried to put a table together to make it easier. Remember, if they have heart failure or renal disease, that's going to push you towards empagliflozin. If they've got an EGFR, you know, 15 to 29 mil per minute, then you can't use empagliflozin, whereas dutoglutide is safe. Um, similarly, if they've got cerebrovascular disease, it's going to push you more towards the dutoglutide as well. Some patients you won't be able to use empagliflozin in, so particularly those with a very low carb diet or keto diet um, or significant alcohol intake because of the risk of DKA, that's going to push you more towards dutoglutide. Some of you will have those with you know, significant gastrointestinal disease, which will push you more towards the empagliflozin. So if they get adverse effects on one, you, that's going to make you probably switch to the other. Um, and as I discussed, you know, there's also many patients um, who don't like taking tablets and we prefer an injection once a week. So going through having that discussion with, with your patients is, is really important. So in terms of, of how you use it, um, I know many of you will be familiar with this already, um, but just going through it in a stepwise process, um, basically it's quite, you only got one, um, you know, one dose of injection. You can start that on any day of the week, um, any, any time of the day. And I think it's really important to show 
um, you know, patients ideally in, in the room. Uh, we might get the practice nurse to do it on, on how to inject. Um, and as I said, if you don't have time, just write, please provide pharmacy education. Um, and that can be done. And just thinking about Sharp's disposal as well um, for your region. Um, but often, you know, the pharmacist may take care of, of that anyhow. Um, when you, um, I guess, start to do glutide, so I spoke about ad nauseum now, but do think about you know pushing that lifestyle management, making sure that and making sure they're on metformin as well, and just looking you know are they on Galvis or Galvimet? As long as you're going to stop that, and if it's Galvimet, I'm going to put them back on on metformin alone. Now, dudaglutide will not cause um, hypoglycemia alone, but if you've got a patient which is on insulin or sulfonylureas. Um, then you may actually cause hypoglycemia, particularly if they've already got tight glycemic control. There's no perfect number here, but I'd say anyone that had an HbA1c less than 64 um, minimal per mole may be slightly, slightly higher um, in those more elderly, then I'd actually proactively reduce the dose of insulin and sulfonylurea before you start to do glutide. And a rough rule of thumb is you halve the dose of sulfonylurea and you reduce the dose of total daily dose of insulin by around about 15 to 20%. And that's both basal and, and prandial insulin. Um, so just remember that if the HPNC is above, for example, 75 millimole per mole, you like you have to do nothing. You're adding it on, okay, in terms of, so you can keep the same doses of, of insulin sulfonylurea and you just add, add in the deuteroglutide. I think what's really, um, I guess, important as well is when you're starting deuteroglutide is discussing the adverse effects. And, you know, you're discussing that they will likely occur, um, but they're typically transient and you don't need to do anything about it. Um, I've always found that, um, so for those patients that are aware, they're likely, um, of adverse effects, they just likely push through um, and, and keep going and fine. Um, I would encourage you to talk to your, um, your Lily rep um, to see if you can get the, the booklet um, into, um, the booklet on deuteroglutide into your practice because it's very useful um, and an easy way of, of handing over the information. The Health Navigator um, page, and I'll come to that in a moment, is also useful um, as well in terms of just put, trying to put in simple terms of what adverse effects may occur. So there are ways to reduce the adverse effects as well. Um, so I always also talk about that um, at the time. And it sounds funny, but one of the um, biggest things is actually getting your patients to eat to appetite. It may be for many a long time since they actually felt full after having food. So I stress that point, if you feel full, you do not need to eat any more. If you eat more, that's when you typically get the nausea and problems with vomiting. So it may be they have to eat smaller meals more frequently um, to you know, still get enough intake, but reduce, reduce that nausea. Um, otherwise it's similar to, to reflux. You know, you're saying avoid food you know, two hours before bed, ideally avoid fried food as alcohol as well, um, as that can make it worse. You also want you to make sure that they remain well hydrated, particularly if they do have adverse, um, adverse effects, because you also want to make sure that you're preventing that rare risk of renal injury. But I will stress that that, that's, that is um, very rare. Um, I sort of spoken about before, it really is about, um, in terms of making sure you don't run into trouble, is, is appropriate patient selection. So you are thinking about, you know, you know, um, just making sure that if the patient's going to be hit for six, that you're avoiding deuteroglutide, you know, around that vomiting or diarrhea, making sure they're not pregnant or, or breastfeeding or having significant GI disease. Otherwise, I'd really encourage you to go on um, and just um, start, use it, use it more and more. Um, and another tip I do is I always get patients um, to contact me or we contact the practice if they do have significant adverse effects. Um, because I will say that's twofold. It's one to make sure that they um, basically don't need any additional treatment. And I will say antiemetics are very effective in reducing the nausea. Um, and basically, I found all of them to be effective. And, and there's no real evidence to say one's better than, than the other. Um, you would think that domperidone and metoclopramide may be better just because the mechanism of action, but basically any anyone's fine. The other thing is, as well is it's also um, you know, a good idea, particularly for those on insulin sulfonylureas, to contact, um, you know, to increase the testing of their glucose levels um, when you start to do glutide, and that may be either th through finger pricks or continuous glucose monitoring. Um, and they can contact you once again if they ever have any episodes of hypoglycemia or significant hyperglycemia, just so you can escalate um, escalate therapy. So in terms of follow up, uh, you know, I spoke about you know, I think having that close contact, that phone follow up 
for one to two weeks for high risk patients is reasonable. Um, but otherwise, three months of repeat HPNC is absolutely fine. Um, and then um, if that, that's when, you know, if HPNC is above target, you could consider adding in um, a second injection a week. Um, but otherwise, it's um, you're looking at, you know, looking at um, what's in, if the HPNC is remained above target. And remember that also as well, that um, type 2 diabetes is, is a progressive disease. So with time, um, you know, you will find typically that the HPNC increases through no fault of the own of, of the patient. So please remember to do, you know, well, it's why we always do the HPNC three monthly if it's above target, and then six monthly once the patient's to target, just to make sure that you know the HPNC stayed below where, where you want it. Um, so I will say, you know, around empagliflozin, if if they can't self-fund that, and the and the full cost is around about eighty-five dollars a month that a um, couple of strategies are, if they're already getting financial assistance from, from WINS, then I have heard of um, many places in the country being successful with WINS um, helping that additional funding. The other way is that, um, and once again, this is, I will say this is off-label practice, but a good way of getting empagliflozin on board is you could use half a 25 milligram tablet of empagliflozin a week, or one of the thousand milligram, you know, slash twelve point five milligram, um, Jardi Met tablets a week, and that way the patient only costs uh, costs the patients forty dollars a month, um, and that way it can be you know a lot more palatable um, option for many. Um, the other, I guess, clinical pearl I really want to push home is the data show that it's not happening. Is remember it's also the time to be pushing you know the tried and true, the stuff we know that it that that works. Yeah, so the lifestyle intervention, you know, thinking about dietitian input as well, making sure your patients on, on metformin and also um, statins and ACE inhibitant arms because they will have further benefits um, in, in weight loss and also preventing cardiovascular disease and progression of renal disease. That always remains um, important. In terms of resources um, to help you um, with that, um, we've got our NTSD, which stands for New Zealand's um, Society of Study of Diabetes, the guidance. Here's the website here for the, for the algorithm I showed before as well. I think it is a really useful, um, succinct, pragmatic um, resource for, for, um, for both primary and secondary care. So I'd encourage you to look at that if you haven't already. Um, the Akaha Ringa also um, has some useful information algorithms. So that is now, I guess, um, who's now got BPAC's contract in terms of helping with, with education of, of primary care. They also have a, a, a useful um, dashboard. So I've shown you the data, I guess, from our Waikato Diabetes Dashboard. I know many of you across Aotearoa do not have access uh, to a dashboard such as that. So I would encourage you to use the EPIC um, dashboard on um, the Hiaka Hiringa site. And that is actually a way as well. It doesn't have the, the pure clinical breakdown in terms of what we have with cardiovascular renal disease, but you can see how your prescribing is going compared to others across Aotearoa. And that's a useful way for benchmarking as well. Um, so I'd encourage you to, um, to use that. I've spoken about the Health Navigator um, information. I have had a look at that as well and helped design that to make sure it's consistent. Um, with, with best practice, but it's an easy print offable page if you don't have the Trulicity booklet. And all the information that I've spoken about um, tonight um, is, should be in your health pathways, but also it's, we've found that rolling that out nationally, probably more problematic than it should be. Um, but hopefully it's on your, your regional health pathways um, as well. So this is showing what the NZSD guidance looks like. For example, under your GLP-1 receptor agonists, um, all that information's um, there. Um, and um, similarly for algorithm for Yaka Hiringa, Health Navigator page for Dudaglutide uh, as well. So I just want to finish on a quick case um, and hopefully have enough time for um, some questions. Um, so here we have you know, a typical patient, a 59-year-old Māori woman with type 2 diabetes, um, central obesity with, with cardiovascular disease and the risk factors, and some evidence of, of early renal disease. She's not doing too badly um, on the HbA1c is 63 millimole per mole. Um, on her um, sort of maximum dose um, galvimet, um, as well as some um, um, Lantus um, 30 units um, at night. Um, and there are, she does see an ad on, on TV, and there has been a big campaign um, for um, 
empagliflozin and dilaglutide on tubes. You may be aware of that and have patients come in as a result of that. Um, and she's keen to basically prevent um, herself from dying from cardiovascular disease, which is seen from the rest of a, of a funnel. And the question is, you know, should she be on dilaglutide empagliflozin and, and which one is, is, is better for her? Um, so to go through it, I think, yes, she does have cardiovascular disease. Um, she's got an HB1C above target on... Um, you know, on, on her current therapy, yes, she should have escalation of therapy is a simple answer. Understandably, you know, she is anxious around those injections, you know, for diabetes. As you remember, having that conversation, dilaglutide is not insulin. It will not cause hypoglycemia or weight gain. Um, in fact, it'll do, it'll do the, um, you know, it'll do the opposite um, for, for the latter. Um, and she's keen um, for dilaglutide, um, given the greater potential for weight loss, and she's keen to get off her insulin. Um, and also that around that sort of primary prevention. So I, I think that's very reasonable. She only had mild renal disease. If she had significant renal disease, and that would push me more towards um, empagliflozin. So remember that she was on galvimet. So you switch your galvimet to metformin alone. And being proactive to reduce that risk of hypoglycemia, you reduce that dose of Lantus by about 20% or you know um, six units um, and take it down to 24 units at night. You go over the injection technique whilst you've got her there, and you just warn her of adverse effects, particularly nausea, and those tips I spoke about in terms of, of reducing that. Um, given she's on insulin, you do just organise a phone appointment with your nurses um, in a week, um, and you get her to you know, just increase that monitoring of, of their glucose levels. And in fact, she has noticed a marked improvement, and I will say the improvement that you get between patients can be quite variable. A lot depends on the... Um, the reduction that they get in appetite and our intake. Um, but you will have some that have quite a dramatic effect, um, such as Fitness's W, who knows that she's now starting to get hypoglycemia. So you have her Lantus, um, and um, basically her repeat HB1C in three months is, is um, great improvement down to 45 millimole per mole. So you're able to stop her insulin. I think that is the ex potentially exciting thing around around dutoglutide, but I would do it in a stepwise fashion um, like this, unless they're on very low dose um, of, of insulin. Um, she was a bit of a rebound, but she stayed to target um, with HB on C of 50 um, millimole per mole. So then remember, she's to target, you're gonna organize further follow-up um, in six months. And here's just, a, I threw this in at the bottom, um, just to remind you that type two diabetes is a progressive disease. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, once again, through no fault of, the, of, of patients, you notice that 18 months down the track, HBNC has increased up. So, you know, which is the best agent to add in now? Um, it's a bit of a rhetorical question, but that, that answers Empica flows in, and hopefully we do get some change in the funding criteria um, you know, before 18, in 18 months' time. Um, but that's, that's when you have that discussion around, around self-funding. Sorry, I know I did go on for, um, for a long time, but I hope you did find that, um, find that useful. And we're happy to take any um, any any questions. Oh, thanks, Louise. Thank you for that fantastic presentation. We do have a number of questions. The first one is treating to target. What is your ideal target? Yeah, it's a good question. For most people, it would be an HB1C less than fifty-three uh, millimole per mole. For those that are young um, and or have any um, and in particular got complications or they're thinking about pregnancy, then I would actually aim for less than forty-eight millimole per mole if the risk of hypoglycemia is low. So what that means is essentially if they're not on insulin sulfurase, and yes, for that group, I would be aiming for less than 48. Um, on the same token, for those where you're worried about the risk of hypoglycemia or there's no benefit um, really for getting tight control, and that would basically mean those who in their lifetime will not develop microvascular or macrovascular complications of their diabetes. So particularly if they've got a terminal illness, well, they may be elderly and just diagnosed with, with diabetes. You know, it takes 10 to 15 years typically to develop complications and actually relax the HP1C to, to 60, 70 um, millimole per mole is more than reasonable. So it, it is an individual individualization, um, but just remember for most, it's less than 53 millimole per mole. Thank you for that. Thinking about weight loss, is there a role for dulaglutide in weight loss in a patient without diabetes? Yeah, it's another good question. I will say it's not registered for that in, in our tera, so I'm not going to encourage you to, to practice off, off label. Um, saying that, um, you know, it's a it's a more attractive option than liraglutide um, or Saxenda, which is the approved GLP-1 receptor agonist for that in New Zealand, given it's probably about half the price. 
Um, but I will just I will just emphasize it's, it's not registered for that. Great. The next question is primary prevention in pre-diabetes. Yeah, there's no, um, I will say there's no evidence to date, um, basically for any agent other than metformin um, for either preventing the progression of, of diabetes or preventing the development of cardiovascular disease or, or renal disease. Um, so to date, it's only really metformin in those with pre-diabetes. Great. So that rolls on to the next question. So someone with a high cardiovascular disease risk without diabetes, would you suggest uh, use of dulaglutide and is it subsidized for this indication? Well, it's only, I guess, subsidized for those with an HbA1c over 53. Um, if you extrapolate, I guess, from all the cardiovascular trials that we've got with diabetes, there's probably no benefit um, for reducing the HbA1c further below than 45 millimole per mole. So then you get in this gray area, um, you know, between 45 to 53 millimole per mole. I will say for those between 45 to 48, I'd only be using metformin. I would not be considering dulaglutide in those patients. You know, for those on HbA1c between um, sort of 48 to 53, then I may think about discussing dulaglutide for self-funding. Um, but yeah, I will stress, you know, uh, there's no point um, pushing someone below 45 millimole per mole to reduce their risk of cardiovascular disease. Do you ever use C peptide levels when um, using dulaglutide? No, I, I don't worry about C peptide at all. Um, the reason why, um, I guess, is because you've got no risk of diabetic ketoacidosis for dulaglutide. That's only for empagliflozin. So you do not need to worry about endogenous insulin production at all. Um, the times where I think C peptide is useful is that um, basically it knows if it's high, you know they've already got high endogenous insulin production. I try and use every other glucose lowering therapy other than insulin and sulfonylureas, basically just to try and improve their glycemic control because I know insulin's probably have a lesser effect in that group. And that's where I'd use C peptide more, I guess, in this case for indications of dulaglutide. But I would not routinely measure C peptide um, for, for, for these patients. Thank you. So thinking which regime is more effective, metformin and valdegliptin and EMPA, or metformin and dulaglutide, which one would you choose and why? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Because, yeah, when you do start dulaglutide, you are forced to start valdegliptin. You think about you know which regimen's better. Um, there's no, I guess, definitive evidence to say which, which one's 100%. I think a lot of it, I'd base my decision on whether Empica flows on dulaglutide is best. Because vertigliptin only on average produces HbA1c about five millimole per mole. So I'll go back, you know, go back to Empica flows on dulaglutide. If it's renal failure and heart failure, you know, Empica flows in. If it's um, otherwise, it may sway you more towards um, more towards dulaglutide. Thank you for that one. Um, thinking now about the twice weekly dosing, we've Got lots of questions about that. So are both of the doses funded? This is the first question. Yeah, they are. Um, and I know I've had no issues. So I know many others do, isn't it? And they've had no issues. Um, I will once again stress that it's technically off-label use um, and it's not registered for that. Um, but what we really want is to have the three and 4.5 milligram doses um, available now to the right, so we don't have to do that. Um, the short answer is that if, if they're under the special authority criteria, they shouldn't have to, have, have to self-fund. Great. So we would expect no pushback from pharmacies across the country? Uh, initially, uh, personally, I, I did find some pushback. Um, but as soon as pharmacists found out that, um, and I always had friendly conversations with the pharmacists about this, um, as soon as they found out that they will receive the dispensing for two, usually it's, it's been okay and, and smooth sailing. But don't be surprised if your pharmacist does ring you up and say, look, it's, it's only registered for, for one dose a week. Um, but as it's becoming more common practice, um, I suspect more, more and more pharmacists are aware as well. Right. And when using the higher dose of dulaglutide, do we need to worry about the GFR, especially if it's under 15? No, um, oh, I wouldn't be using, oh, so I would not be using dulaglutide at all if the EGFR is less than 15 mil per minute. Um, you don't necessarily need to worry about um, anything. So, so we'll also stress with dulaglutide, you do not get that transient drop in EGFR like you do with empagliflozin. So the EGFR shouldn't change with dulaglutide. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily. Be, be, be worried about that as being being a factor as well. But obviously, they may get an increased risk of 
um, gastrointestinal adverse effects with the um, with you know double, essentially double the dose. Great. And when do we stop dulaglutide? Yeah, it's it's a good question um, because you can argue that you know you're basically going to continue it for life. Um, I guess it's the times when you normally um, de-escalate therapy. So if they're having any adverse effects that were too great, obviously you'd stop it then. If they became pregnant um, or and then breastfed, I'll, I'll be stopping the dulaglutide then. Or basically, if the you know benefits of dulaglutide out or the risks of dulaglutide outweigh the outweigh the benefits, particularly I guess when you're getting into those with, with terminal illness um, or, or they're very frail. Um, then I'll be stopping it. The other time as well is you may be forced to stop it um, around GI surgery and that, but I will also emphasize again that you do not have the risk of DKA with dutaglutide. It's, it's only empagliflozin. So you do not need to stop dutaglutide when, when, when they're sick, you know, or around procedures saying that um, they've already got the, one, they've already got the dutaglutide on board. Um, and two, if they are having a gastrointestinal illness, you may say, hey, look, just delay your dutaglutide injection until you're feeling well again um, before you restart it. But otherwise, you, you're continuing it um, long term. Great. And just to clarify with the special authority criteria, if a patient has met criteria within the last 12 months and their cardiovascular risk criteria has changed, risk assessment has changed, or the HbA1 has dropped, do they still continue to meet criteria? Yeah, yeah only, only have to meet it once. So it's, it's a lifelong um, special authority approval. Um, so I would, yeah, um, don't worry about, hopefully they're definitely the HbA1c and um, will improve. Um, so, so don't worry about it. Um, the hard part, is, is, uh, I guess the previous question was hinting about, is these patients, you get the HbA1c down into the 30s um, in terms of stopping. Um, and, and that can be a really hard question to um, say whether they continue the dutaglutide if, if, or not. If they are getting benefit from ongoing weight loss, I often keep the dutaglutide going. If they're not, um, then that's a time we'd actually consider stopping the dutaglutide. You can always restart it if the HbA1c climbs back up. But in those cases, I probably would continue the metformin, at least in the short term, um, and, and make sure that, this is, you know, that, that they remain, I guess, in the normal range for at least... Um, a year or two at least um, that long before before stopping. Fantastic. And um, if a patient has pancreatitis whilst on treatment, can you just give us a, a clearer guidance on that, please? Yeah, um, it, it, there's no clear cut blanket rule. If it was um, due to a clear precipitant such as um, gallstones and they go on to have um, or alcohol, um, and they're going to either stop alcohol and go on to have a cholecystectomy, then I'll actually have no problems with continuing the dulaglutide. If it's a bit grey um, in terms of what the cause was, then I, I actually would stop the dulaglutide. Um, if um, dulaglutide can, I didn't mention it earlier, can actually increase um, your risk just slightly of, of cholelithiasis um, and gallstones. So if they did have gallstone-induced pancreatitis, then I may actually withhold the dulaglutide until they have their cholecystectomy. Um, but after that, I'd actually be happy to restart it. Um, so a lot depends on the on the actual cause. If you've got pancreatitis with a really unclear cause, then I, I wouldn't restart the dulaglutide. Fantastic. Around pregnancy, at what point do we stop dulaglutide? Is it yeah. trying that's, to conceive or when they're pregnant? Yeah, that's, that's another very good question and hard to give a, a blanket rule. If they're, I will say, if they're pregnant, I'll definitely stop it. Okay, so as soon as that's confirmed, there's many of our, um, you know, many um, pregnancies when with diabetes aren't planned. The one thing I should have mentioned earlier is when you start um, dulaglutide, that itself may induce ovulation um, up and above glycemic control. Um, so it's, I guess, many of our women have positive ovarian syndrome, and dulaglutide is actually quite effective um, for the for, fertility side of that. So one thing I would do is, is make sure a woman of childbearing age is on contraception. Um, and then when you think about planning pregnancy, um, for many of these women, it may take six to 12 months to conceive, and they may not be happy on going when the two only, two only um, safe glucose lowering therapies in pregnancy are um, metformin and insulin. And they may, it's, you could actually discuss that and say, you know, this is what, what, what we can do. If they're willing to go on insulin, um, then I think it's very reasonable to do at that stage before conception. 
Um, if they say, actually, I don't want to, um, you know, I don't want to go on to insulin at this stage, then I, I think I'd continue the dubutide and and stop it once they get pregnant. Um, but I would have that discussion with the, I guess, with, with the woman about what, what's best for her. Um, is it, is, there's no safety data, so I can't can't basically say. Um, there's, not, there's nothing on animal studies to sh um, suggest significant um, um, genicity, but um, yeah, we're just, we're just going by what's, what's available. What's your advice for fasting on patients on dulaglutide, thinking Ramadan or other planned fasts? Yeah, um, the good news is that um, there's no increased risk of hypoglycemia, um, which is actually a major contraindication and precaution around fasting. So it's, it's fine to fast. You've also got no worries about the low carb intake in terms of DKA that you do have with the flows in. So I think if, if you've got a patient that's fasting, um, then you know metformin and dulaglutide are actually the best glucose lowering therapies to use. Um, they they can essentially do do whatever they want. Great. If you're unable to tolerate metformin, is it okay to be on dulaglutide alone? Yep, that, that's fine. Um, I will say though, for most patients that say they can't tolerate metformin, um, often that's on on high doses, or they'll be started off too rapidly. And I'd always encourage people that have this diagnose of metformin intolerance to be started off on, on 250 milligrams a day um, and for that to be very slowly increased um, and often many of those patients will tolerate metformin well and even if they only can get 250 milligrams in a day it will still be beneficial um, so I'll just make sure that you know they are truly intolerant if they are then I would kick metformin to touch I wouldn't be forcing the issue and then glutide alone is, is absolutely absolutely reasonable. Some more special cases. So if somebody has a single functioning kidney, um, do we need to think about this as a special case or concern? Yeah, I'm not aware of actually any literature specifically around a single kidney, kidney for either deuteglutide or empagliflozin, um, but I bet you'd be a lot less worried for deuteglutide um, than I would for empagliflozin. If it's if they're under a renal physician, I always put the question to the renal physician, um, but for... Most I envision that deuteglutide would be absolutely fine. Um, but once again, for those, just remember that EGFR cutoff and that for a single kidney, it may be slightly different, you know, in terms of not purely the 15 mil per minute. So it's just being, being aware of that. Retinopathy, which would be your choice, Jardiance or Trulicity? Um, there's no um, conclusive evidence that either is better or worse um, for retinopathy. I know there's some literature suggesting potential for, for aggravating um retinopathy with deuteglutide but that's uh, basically i wouldn't be i wouldn't be worried about that at all and i think any agent that you can do to improve the glycemic control would be great so the same with neuropathy as well it's running around renal disease and cardiovascular disease where, where, they, where they differ great um just going back to your clinical case why did you decide to add EMPA rather than increasing the deuteglutide to twice a week oh that's a good question um I probably as I wrote that case before, it was common practice to increase the due to twice a week. Um, that would be a very reasonable thing to do, do in the first instance. Um, and, you know, the other caveat would be if she wasn't tolerated, you know, didn't want to increase or, you know, didn't want to have um, potential for adverse effects and EMPA would be be reasonable. That, that's, but that's a good point. You could um, easily do that instead of um, the additional of EMPA flows. Right. Thank you. Um, are there any cases that do not respond to due to blue change? Yeah, there are some. I mean, type 2 diabetes is a very heterogeneous disease, and you will find some respond to due to blue type very well, and you will find that some get a minimal response. Even though you may see a minimal response in glucose control and weight, you are probably still getting that cardiovascular benefit. So that's always important to remember, you know, that you're still getting some response. Um, but that may be very reasonable if your patient doesn't seem to be responding and you can only choose one of the empagliflozin and deuteglutide, that would be an indication for switching from deuteglutide to empagliflozin. Fantastic. When somebody has um, UTIs on the SGLT2s, what's your threshold for stopping? You, you should, usually the patient would tell you that they want to, they want to stop, particularly if the, the thrush is problematic. Um, I think if you ever had someone that's yet frequent UTIs that's making them miserable or they've had a significant, you know, um, UTI pyonephritis, that would definitely twist my arm. Um, saying that, 
often, um, particularly that the thrush with empagliflozin is transient, and you may use, you know, you may treat with once weekly fluconazole, for example, um, for a couple of weeks, and as the glucose levels come back down, then actually the genital urinary symptoms stop um, as well. So it would, it, it would be the persistence of those symptoms, or sometimes they're too severe initially, and, and that would make me make me stop. But if they were coping fine with mild thrush and it went away, then no, I would keep going with the empagliflozin. Great. Just three more questions and we're coming to an end. Um, so the millimole drop to be expected from Jardians? It's, it's similar um, to, to the glutide. Once again, it's very dependent on, on your baseline glycemic control. It's probably just slightly less than what we see for, for dilutide. So you can still get dramatic reductions. And I've also had patients that have had 20 to 30 millimole per mole reductions in empagliflozin as well. Um, I will say though, if their baseline glycemic control is decent or fair, um, they're unlikely to get genital urinary adverse effects. Um, it's those that have very high glucose levels, just because they get so much more glycosuria, that the other ones that get the genital urinary adverse effects. So just, just be aware of that um, when you're starting it. Great. You mentioned um, the 10 to 17 year old group. Can you just yep. clarify uh, that was in type 2 diabetes? Yeah, type 2 diabetes. Sorry. This is all type 2 diabetes. I should have emphasized that. I would not be using um, dutaglutide in type 1 diabetes or monogenic diabetes without really discussing um, with a specialist. There, there probably will be a role for them in that group, but that, yeah, I, I wouldn't be concerned about that. It's only type 2 diabetes. And, and previously, in that age group, the only safe therapies which you knew about were metformin and insulin. So is actually a major um, addition um, to that group and, and hopefully give us a whole lot more treatment option given them to target. Just around nausea again. Um, so after six weeks of dulaglutide, your patient is still nauseated. How long would you encourage them to persist? And... Um, You've mentioned there's no difference in um, antiemetics. Um, yeah, I haven't so found any um, clinically significant differences. If it, if it's six weeks down the track, to be honest, I'd probably cut my losses and and switch it to um, empagliflozin or, or alternative. I think if, it, if it's still persisting at that stage, then it's probably going to stay there. Potentially, you could perhaps space out the injection, like you may go to every ten days or or so. Um, but if the nausea is still problematic, I'll just, to be honest, personally, I'll, I'll, I'll stop it. Six weeks is a long time to feel yeah, nauseated. Is. Yeah. Um, mature onset type 1 diabetes, is there any data for SGLT2 inhibitors, especially if there's a history of preceding metabolic syndrome or pre-diabetes? Yep, they are, they are a difficult group. Um, and yes, yes, yes is the short answer, um, particularly if they have decent ongoing endogenous insulin production. Um, and that's where C-peptide can be very useful. There's a many of our patients in this group have mixed sort of mixed type one, type two diabetes. If I'd probably still though, um, in that group, that is one group which I would discuss with, with specialist care first, even though it's just seeking advice, um, just because they are still at increased risk of DK with empagliflozin. And that's where actually dutaglutide may also be more attractive um, as an alternative. Um, and personally, I do, you know, if they do have two types of diabetes, which is, is more than, um, you know, which is quite common that you can still get them under the special authority criteria. But I'll just be a little bit more cautious with empagliflozin in that group. So how would they meet the special authority? Oh, just in terms of got, essentially they've got two types of diabetes. Right. But those that have pure, I will say those that have pure mature onset type 1 diabetes, um, um, and they do have insulin deficiency with that, then you know, you're going to get, I would not be using bigger flows and doodle glutide in that group. As I said, I think, you know, as, as, a, as a question was, there are many cases with, with mixed. Fantastic. Well, we've come to the end of our live. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for answering all of those for us and for a fantastic presentation tonight. Kia ora everyone and thank you for joining us tonight.